I want to pay tribute to Jeremy Corbyn, who led our party through some really difficult times, who energised our movement, and who's a friend as well as a colleague. And to all of our supporters and affiliates, I say this. Whether you voted for me or not, I will represent you, I will listen to you, and I will bring our party together. matter because we are here to do the business that the Labour Party has not done. The Ford Inquiry Report. This is how we are here with our renowned panellists, well at least one, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ken Loach. It is second of all. <laughs> we have Mr. Graham Bash. <laughs> Retired solicitor to the oppressed. <laughs> Jewish voice for labor, executive member, and a labor activist, at least when I last checked, for 150 years. <laughs> Welcome to Graham. And finally, who I have to introduce you is here, Sir Norman Licky. He is the counsel for the Labour Party. Now, the serious business. <laughs> I received an administrative suspension on May the 18th, 2020, and that's going to be a significant date. And I was also excluded less than two weeks later at the start of June. And I was also excluded for one single tweet, which I made eight months earlier, which said, the 99% of people will have the best friend in Chris Williamson as an MP, who, if re-elected, will work for them. I was a Labour Party member in good standing in May 2020. At that time, I held no office in my branch or in the CLP, and it was in the middle of a pandemic. When I got the suspension on May the 18th, I found it extraordinary, so I immediately made a subject access request to the Labour Party. When I got that in November 2020, I understood why I had been expelled. And at this point, instead of talking about me, I'd like to talk about Sakia and tell you what Sakia was doing on May the 18th, 2020. On May the 11th, Keir Starmer had a memo from the British Board of Deputies. And I have the redacted version here. Mm -hmm. 
memo listed 11 members of the Labour Party, which the Board of Deputies considered the most serious cases they have seen. And I came in at number eight. <laughs> the evidence that was prayed by the Board of Deputies to Sir Keir on May the 11th was one tweet about Israel, which was made in 2015, and another tweet which was made in 2016, in which I said that Chukka and Munna was guilty of conflating Zionism with Judaism. So for the eighth most serious case, they couldn't find anything from 2016 to 2020, and they used two tweets which had in fact been before the Labour Party twice before and turned down. And I have to say, if four years later the Board of Deputies claim that I am one of the most serious cases of anti-Semitism, despite finding nothing, uh, frankly, w which cases are serious? Like Keir Starmer, you took this list of 11 names and your immediate staff, known as Lotto, and Lotto ordered staffers to find something to expel me for, because he had to report back to the Board of Deputies by the end of May. And in my subject access request, there is an exchange of emails between the leader's office and the staffers until they eventually alight on the tweet about Chris. And then their emails say, will this do? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, what do other people think? Yes, I think we can do her for supporting another candidate. And so on. They used that one tweet, they suspended me in May, and despite having supporting statement from the Labour MP I had campaigned for in the 2019 election, uh, I was expelled. Uh, it, he was told to get me expelled. So, I accuse Mr... Oh, sorry, Sir, Sir Keir, of being a liar, a cruel and ruthless cheat, and the Labour Party are doing the bidding of who knows who, but it's certainly not the members. Oh, and by the way, Sir Keir, I didn't have to ring the Samaritans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, please. This is a serious inquiry. Right, Mr. Lickspittle? Licky, please. Licky, QC. Please. I beg your pardon. Licky, please. Miss, Miss Massey, can I just... Did it, you, you, you can't deny that you did support a person who was a candidate for, the, for another party other than the Labour Party in the election. Is that not so, i.e. Mr. Mr. Williamson? I deny that completely, Licky. Well, we've seen the in, emails. No, the tweet. In the tweet, I say kind words about a man who had been in the Labour Party over 40 years, who was being abused on social media, and I sent a nice tweet about him. I did not follow it with, you must campaign for him, you must vote for him. But you clearly you were supporting him. You can be him. kind, I beg your pardon, you can be kind and courteous to people who are not in the Labour Party. That's not forbidden. Can I, can I just say I'm somewhat constrained here because I can't possibly comment directly on the case as it's a disciplinary matter and therefore highly confidential. <laughs> <laughs> and in general, tricky, I would licky. say... Tricky, licky. Oh, 
sorry, and, sorry. And in general, I would say that it's no surprise to me if the witness was guilty on both counts of being anti-Semitic and supporting someone standing against Labour. And I'm sure if Sir Keith would have commented to the Labour Party staff and commended them for getting two for the price of one. Graham Bash, you have a question? Well, I do, Ms. Massey. Um, I can understand why the board of deputies would want to get rid of you. But could you explain, because I think this panel here needs some explanation, why on earth do you think Sir Keith would listen to the Board of Deputies? Well, I think Sir Keith himself, if only he wasn't so wooden and he could actually speak, I think he would say because he is a Zionist without qualification and the Board of Deputies are a Zionist organisation and they're there to promote Zionist ideology. Ms Massey, as you're aware, there are a number of Jewish activists who are anti or non-Zionists in the party. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them in Brighton. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could explain then, if this is about anti-Semitism, why Sir Keith didn't speak to those who number very many, Jewish Voice for Labour and a number of other uh, good socialist internationalists who are Jewish. <laughs> Why didn't they listen and speak to them? A brief answer now, please, Miss Matthews. I cannot speak for Sir Keith. I refer to my previous answer, but what I would say to you, Mr Bash, is that I have been a long-time campaigner for the rights of the Palestinian people and justice for, for them. And I think I might have annoyed some Zionists in Brighton. Right now, we have a very different sort of witness. We have a witness here who is so scared of her position, she is not prepared to come and speak. So I have been given the task to give witness for her. She has written her statement. I assure you, she is a real live person <laughs> and she will be watching right now what is happening. I want you to listen to her testimony. I'm a black woman, a single parent, I've got a 16-year-old daughter. I got into politics wanting to end homelessness. I joined up because of Corbyn, like hundreds of thousands of us. The election I worked on most was 2019, so to read what was in the leaked report. When I saw it in black and white with those nasty words they use about us black members, I mean, we were going day and night campaigning for Labour and all the time these people were actually trying to sabotage and they did it. We lost. Personally, I can never forgive them. I literally put my heart and soul into that campaign and everything what that leaked report said is the same as what I've seen locally. But where can I begin? Problem is, you know, I can't give no names. These people have money and power, and they will come after you. I'll try anyway. I've had negative comments, been questioned about my identity, my family background, in a way that no white person would be. And then there's representation. Where I live, we have the third most black people in the London area. But I'm the only black Caribbean person in my CLP. Sometimes the worst racism, though, you know, it's not the simple kind like calling somebody a name. It's, it's more like a racism that's, that's harder to prove. But that can be the worst kind. I'll tell you. My mum lived where she's lived for 30 years. First time she met anyone from Labour was 2019, under Corbyn. And that was because of Labour's new community organiser. It was her who said, yes, let's go. Let's can, 
canvassed council estates. And when Starmer became leader, he sacked them all. Even though they were effective, sacked them, Starmer said, so he could save money. But at the same time, he gave hundreds and thousands to what they call whistleblowers, even though solicitors told them not to do it. Now that money, that money could have been used to pay wages to those organisers. If that had happened, more black people could have been brought into being active members. But no, you see, that's the kind of quiet racism that keeps black people out of the party. <laughs> Apart from when it suits his politics, Starmer... He just ignores race. Until the protests after George Floyd was murdered, they did nothing. Taking the knee in the Union Jack, that thing, flying behind them, that was just a publicity stunt. When he called Black Lives Matter a moment, that's what he really thinks. Only after there were so many complaints, Starmer took half a day of anti-black racism training. Half a day! He needs years! <laughs> Seriously, look at Starmer's record. He praises himself as director of public prosecutions, but the amount of black boys sent to prison because of him. In the 2011 riots, it was Starmer who kept those courts open and running 24 hours a day processing mostly black boys as quickly as possible, and there was no justice there. Solidarity with Jewish people and what they go through. But there is a hierarchy of race in the Labour Party. They don't care about no other racism. They only care about anti-Semitism. And if you don't follow the leadership's line, then you are called anti-Semitic. I don't care. I don't care what happens, I'll say what I like to anybody. But if I don't get this role as councillor, no black person from where I am is going to be doing it. And the ward where I live has got 55% of black people in it and no black representation. And that's not unusual. This is what's happening. This is how it is to be in the Labour Party and black. Yes, I, that was a very moving statement, but I want to say that it was theatrical rather than legal. Uh, mm, yes, it's a point. Uh, I mean, it, it, this was a, an absent chair, an empty chair. A chair is an inanimate object. A chair cannot be a witness. A chair cannot give evidence. What you have heard now is not evidence, but hearsay. So the plan to suspend officers of CRPs was hatched on the eve of the release of the EHRC report, which was issued on the 29th of October 2020. I believe that, I have been told that, regional offices were primed to spot and punish dissenters from the four diktats that were to be issued by the General Secretary between the 29th of October and the 8th of December 2020. As part of this, the General Secretary reinvented the meaning of the term competent business to mean that it would be a crime punishable by exclusion. The suspensions began in November 2020 and carried on to December. An open letter was signed by 284 CRP chairs and secretaries from 194 CLPs out of a total of 630, calling for the suspended officers to be reinstated. 
and for the guidance to be withdrawn. But the General Secretary ignored this open letter totally. Then the CRP secretaries had a meeting with the General Secretary. He said, very kindly, that CRP secretaries were the backbone of the um, 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 party. Um, um, um. <laughs> and he admitted that the situation was um, 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 awkward. <laughs> but that the right to free speech would have to give way to his diktats until such time as um, 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 confidence um, had been um, restored. And he said, there can be no equivocation. <laughs> so that didn't go well. So what was the impact of these suspensions? The officer purges enabled harassment. In my case, my MP reported me for allowing a motion to be heard, which was expressing solidarity with Jeremy Corbyn and which was passed overwhelmingly by my CRP. I was accused by disputes of contact, conduct that was prejudicial or grossly detrimental to the party based on Rule 2.1.8. So 2.1.8 allows an absolute clampdown on freedom of speech and debate. It enables a corrupt NEC or a corrupt party to, to actually promulgate factionalism and harassment. The result of my administrative suspension and that of my chair was that my CLP was completely closed down. There were no meetings, no communications with members apart from an initial vague communication from a vice chair. From that point, the MP who had reported me effectively took over the CLP, writing to members and holding his own meetings. In other words, our, our, our CLP was completely disabled. First of all, can I say that your use of the word diktats suggests that the Labour Party is something of a dictatorship rather than a, de <laughs> a democratic organisation. Can I assure you that we are not a dictatorship? I would not be representing a dictatorship. Well, actually, you're right. That no. wasn't a question, that was a statement on my part. <laughs> the idea that there is any problem with free speech in the Labour Party is an entirely ridiculous one. After all, aren't we here discussing sensitive matters? What could possibly be the matter with that? And I would go further in this matter if I were free to, including <laughs> explaining certain powerful safeguards for freedom of speech which the party, that, that, that which Sir, Sir Keir himself intends to introduce very soon. I would go further with that and explain those to you were it not for the fact that the General Secretary has informed me that at this moment it is not competent business for me to discuss. <laughs> You've given devastating evidence about the closure of parties, but what is the motive? Surely Sir Keith needs vibrant, energetic members canvassing to secure a Labour government. After these suspensions um, and after the CLP closing down, we had basically nobody campaigning. Um, Bristol City Council, which had previously um, been a Labour stronghold, was lost and is now an equal um, Labour and Green Party um, Council. So Labour has lost control of the local council. So I don't understand it either. I think the, the issue that you've raised is one of solidarity. Solidarity, uh, as you see it, with those um, who have been threatened or punished like Jeremy Corbyn or yeah. others in that situation. Well, don't you realise how dangerous solidarity is? <laughs> because if... If, if your aim, you see, and this is where I think I might be able to help uh, my fellow panellists here, because the aim, I, I would suggest, is that the, to make the party acceptable to the Daily Mail and the Sun. <laughs> That's the point. And if, if your aim is to be accepted by the, um, the senior establishment in this country, 
uh, the BBC, The Guardian, uh, to name but a few, then surely you have to show that you do not, you, you, you have to get rid of those who, who suggest structural change and taking away those privileges. So solidarity with those is dangerous and they interfere with your aim. So do you understand the reason? There's a very cogent reason why people like you, I'm afraid, have to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand we should really do as we're told. I really do, I really do understand that. And as you can see, I'm a very dangerous looking person. You are very dangerous. You see, that, that's the danger. It's the quiet ones that are the dangerous ones. <laughs> Now, I'm speaking about what happened to my uh, CLP and the neighbouring CLP. In, uh, uh, that's West Ham and East Ham, which together make up the borough of Newham. Newham has the richest possible labour traditions. It was the borough where Keir Hardy first won a seat, the first ever seat for Labour in Parliament. It was uh, a borough where Sylvia Pankhurst lived and campaigned for many years. In the neighbouring Poplar, George Lansbury led his famous revolt in, uh, in, 19, uh, in the early 1920s. It's a 100% Labour Council, has two Labour MPs, which have massive majorities, one of them the biggest majority, I think, in the country. So that is where we come from, and we have a campaigning record, second to none, of uh, campaigning uh, against the academisation of schools, against the privatisation of GP surgeries, against the erection of a monstrous uh, concert uh, hall in a residential area, uh, of uh, the Silver Link Tunnel, which is going to add to the pollution in what is probably already the most polluted borough in the country, I believe. Uh, we run uh, food banks, school uniform swap shops. Uh, I, I, I won't continue because of the time, but that's, what, that's the kind of party that we have. And then in February, we were subject to a coup, and it had all the, all the hallmarks of a military coup. It was like that, because what happened is they shut down our parties, both parties, simultaneously. The pretexts that were given, because let's be fair, they claimed that there were queries about the membership, and the, even that there was a suggestion of electoral fraud. The fact is that, the, uh, that it was we who had raised membership, queries about uh, false membership of people being signed up by uh, right-wing members of the constituency, but more specifically, that the, uh, the charge of electoral fraud, we checked that with the Metropolitan Police, and they said that allegations had been made a year previously, but that they had been dismissed as being completely baseless and not worthy of further investigation. We believe the real reasons are that we had been campaigning on a socialist programme, that we'd been uh, holding to account the members of the council for the policies that are being carried out, and in particular, and I'd like to say in reply to our, our learned uh, council here, when he says that free speech is guaranteed, one of the resolutions which we were trying to pass from West Ham CLP was that we want to have free speech within the party. And we were told by the party bureaucracy that that was not competent business. <laughs> <laughs> so what we then did is we moved a resolution of no confidence in, um, in the party leader. Now, uh, th we were told that also is out of order. <laughs> now, it's, there are places where you can't question who's the leader. In uh, Thailand, it's against the law to, to uh, criticize the king. In uh, Russia, you're not allowed to criticize Vladimir uh, Putin. In Myanmar, you can't uh, criticize the generals. But that's not good company for the leader of uh, the Labour Party. <laughs> now, we now have, in effect, two Labour parties in Newham. One is the, uh, the councillors and uh, whoever's left still with the rump of the party. But we have an active campaigning membership of what we've had to call, by default, Newham Socialist Labour. And we're continuing all the campaigns and all the agitation that we had before. 
And uh, this is a microcosm. It may seem like just local parish pump politics, but this is a microcosm of the disaster that is taking place in the Labour Party on a national scale. Thanks for me. I cannot possibly comment on the reasons why the local <laughs> parties of East Ham and West Ham have been suspended because they're, they're very complex disciplinary and legal uh, information protection issues. All I get is sort of rumours. I have even heard of cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot even comment on that because I don't know beyond that, so my lips are sealed. Okay, Ken Lodge, would you like to respond? Um, well, as all the witnesses, um, this is extremely impressive um, evidence. Uh, but you see, the, I think I see the problem here in what you said, because you, com you, you campaigned against privatisation. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's fine <laughs> campaigning against privatisation when Sir Keith gives ten pledges. But if you were listening to the Andrew Marr show, you would have realised yes. that actually we don't oppose privatisation no, now. We only oppose it really when it's economically um, not viable. Well, you haven't made that case. So you see, the, the by opposing privatisation, full stop, you put yourself uh, really out of order. Terrible. And, uh, we, Terrible we, crime. We, and the, the, you see, this is not a, and never a question of principle. Never a question of principle for Sir Keith. It's just a question of tactics. I'd like to ask uh, Comrade Silverman, as I was listening to you, the terrible thought got through my, came to my mind that perhaps the leadership of the party detests its members more than it does the Tories. Now, I'm sure that isn't the case. Can you reassure me? Well, there's a very quick answer to that. No. <laughs> On the 13th of August, Friday the 13th, a good day for a witch hunt, various letters were sent out, or emails, saying that um, I was uh, possibly going to be auto-excluded because of the heinous crime of uh, signing an open letter organised by Labour against the witch hunt uh, in uh, February or March 2020, and speaking at a meeting of Labour in Exile Network in February 2021. Um, and these two organisations were among the four that had been proscribed uh, on the 20th of July 2021. So uh, in my response, which I got back very quickly, I reminded them that uh, natural justice would tend to mean that you can't be guilty of a crime that you did uh, before it was declared a crime. But they, I, and uh, I was a delegate to the Labour Party conference, and um, I happily, much to my amazement, got into conference on day one, and I forgot to check my emails on the Saturday <laughs> evening. And when I arrived at conference to go in on day two, my pass no longer worked. Oh! apart from the police being automatically called, they then get to the Labour Party official down and she said, oh, you should have received an email. <laughs> but apart from me, so there's a lot of ways in which this is not about me. It's not about me and I don't believe it's about anti-Semitism, although the ludicrous reason for which those organisations were prescribed was because they are anti-Semitism deniers. If there's any of you who don't know, the best evidence is that 0.4% of the Labour Party members have been accused of anti-Semitism. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they are all guilty as charged. Is that a party rife with anti-Semitism? I don't think so. But if you are a Jewish member of the Labour Party, you are four times as likely as any others to be accused of anti-Semitism. If you are a member of Jewish Voice for Labour, you are about 30 times more likely. And if you are a committee member of Jewish Voice for Labour, you are 235 times more likely to be accused of anti-Semitism. Should anti-Semitism be dealt with? 
absolutely. Is it a more heinous form of racism than racism towards black people, Muslim people, Gypsy Roma or Traveller? I don't think so. Thank you very much. It's a strange old world, isn't it? There has been an outburst of anti-Semitism, it would appear, amongst Jews. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew it was going to go on? But thank you. Mr. Lickspickle? I can be very brief on this one, and there's clearly plenty of evidence that you are a supporter of both Labour Against the Witchcraft and Labour in Exile. <laughs> <laughs> you don't deny it. I have been instructed by Sir Keith to um, totally reject all the self-appointed Jewish Voice for Labour's so-called evidence. This Jewish Voice for Labour is a sham organisation and it is part of a worldwide conspiracy. To... <laughs> Please be quiet. Can you keep order? It's part of a worldwide conspiracy to discredit the state of Israel. The wrong I found your evidence quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. I actually found it offensive. Uh, uh, Anti-Semitic, perhaps. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't. I was actually referring to the evidence of what the Labour Party is yes. doing, accusing left-wing Jews like you, and I'm a fellow officer of JVL and me, and I know that both of us and nearly all officers and members of JVL have fought against racism and anti-Semitism all their lives. Mm. And in my case, it was the fight against anti-Semitism when I was a teenager that brought me into the Labour Party 53 years ago. I feel deeply offended by this. Particularly when I got re-elected in 2017 and the anti-Semitism witch hunt was ratcheting up, I felt it was important to defend people who had been falsely accused. And so I made it my business to defend your daughter, Jackie Walker. I made it my business to defend other people like Tony Greenstein and many other Jewish members of the party who were being accused of anti-Semitism. Over time, I was subjected to all sorts of complaints. Indeed, within a, a matter of weeks, uh, Ruth Smith was calling for the whip to be withdrawn from me for having the temerity to say that the smears against Jeremy Corbyn, that he was a Czech spy, and particularly this nonsense about him being an anti-Semite, uh, was a dirty low-down trick and bullshit. Uh, and apparently I was the, 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 uh, the main topic of conversation at the Jewish Labour Movement uh, meeting uh, two or three weeks uh, later. To cut a long story short, uh, all these complaints built up. I was told by Jenny Formby that she, she gets more complaints about me, she told me, than every other member of the Labour Party put together. <laughs> I said, well, that clearly tells you a story, doesn't it? It's clearly a confected campaign. I was told that, uh, called in because I'd um, uh, spoken at a meeting uh, in Sheffield, and said that uh, Labour was being demonised as a racist, bigoted party. This is the party, I said, that had done more to stand up to racism than any other political party, and certainly done more than any other party to address the scourge of, of anti-Semitism. And I also made the point that uh, we were being too apologetic about our record in fighting uh, anti-Semitism and racism. And uh, for that, I was accused of being an out-and-out -out anti semite uh, and had also had the temerity to book a room to show the film Witch Hunt, which focused a lot on Jackie Walker's story, but it was really about the, the way in which uh, anti-Zionist Jews in the Labour Party were being uh, targeted for a particular disciplinary uh, treatment, etc. I was called in for a meeting. I was told that I needed to make a, uh, an apology. I did that under sufferance as a favor to Jeremy Corbyn and a favor to the uh, Lotto advisors, leader of the opposition uh, office uh, advisors. And um, within a matter of a few hours, uh, that had, no, less than that actually, a matter of a few minutes actually, 40 or 50 minutes, that had been elevated to a full inquiry. By the afternoon, I was speaking to a colleague just off the parliamentary estate and uh, received a telephone call to say to be elevated to a full suspension. As I was taking the telephone call to tell me I was being suspended, Sky News came down the street and were filming me 
actually being told I was being suspended, and as soon as I came off the telephone, I was asked what was my reaction to being suspended. I was eventually reinstated into the Labour Party in uh, June of that year. And um, within uh, uh, 48 hours, there was a huge furore created about how disgraceful it was. Over 100 Labour MPs had signed a motion calling for, uh, to go to the next parliamentary Labour Party, calling for the whip to be withdrawn. 50 odd uh, members of the House, Labour members of the House of Lords had signed that motion as well which was due to go to the next PLP meeting on the following Monday, but uh, Jenny Formby, the General Secretary, beat them to it and decided to reintroduce the suspension, so she re-suspended me. I then took the Labour Party to the High Court. Within 36 hours, I received a letter and I thought, ah, they've, they've seen sense, they've withdrawn the suspension, everything's going to be fine. But no, it was to issue me with a third suspension to say, we know you're already suspended, but irrespective of the outcome of the High Court hearing, you will remain suspended until these further uh, allegations have been investigated. And I accuse Keir Starmer, the Parliamentary Labour Party and the right-wing bureaucrats of actually sabotaging the unique moment in history, the opportunity that we had to bring about an irreversible, an irreversible uh, change in the, in, in the balance of wealth and power in our country. And, and I think that's an unforgivable thing that they did and they stand accused and should be damned to hell, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. rely on Chris to be subtle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Norman Licky Licky. Thank you. I, I rise with some reluctance here because this witness places me in a rather delicate personal position. Um, I have a full and devastating refutation, refutation of everything that the witness has said. But alas, I cannot read it. <laughs> or even mention the witness's name, or admit that I have seen him or met him. <laughs> Sir Keir informs me that this, if I were to do this, it would jeopardize my membership of the Labour Party. <laughs> I am going to have to state for the record that I haven't heard or seen this witness, whoever he is, and if anyone has any pictures of us together, I will sue them for everything they're worth. When this uh, outcry, this, when you were, your suspension was revoked, and I remember it well, and I was listening to the Today programme, I mean, an object lesson in objectivity, if ever there were one, you know, absolutely objective, you know, it always takes a balanced view um, between the Tories and the right-wing Labour Party. Um, and so, but in, the, in this instance, by some extraordinary coincidence, they happened to have um, Lord Falconer, um, Charlie to his friends, if he has any, and um, his, um, he, he was outraged, as you say. Now, how would, how would he know? How would they be able to get him so quickly? onto the, that Today programme when the news had only just broken. And why would they ask him? I discovered on the day that I was suspended, and there was clearly, in my opinion anyway, a conspiracy between the right-wing bureaucracy and the right-wing PLP and the media to smash the Corbyn project and to smash the opportunity to bring about that irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power in our country. We want to say how much we appreciate the solidarity that you showed Dorothy's daughter and all of those who are victims of the witch hunt. And it, and it will never, it will never be forgotten. My question is this, what you have expressed is a very clear um, story of how the establishment exerts its pressure over the Labour Party. We know that. So the question I've got for you is, how do we resist that pressure? Look, we're still strong, aren't we? I mean, those hundreds of thousands of people that joined the Labour Party because they were inspired by Jeremy Corbyn, those millions of people who agreed with the programme that Jeremy set out haven't disappeared and they still hold those views. And our job is to remember the importance of solidarity, remember the words of Percy Shelley, that we are many and they are few. And when we stand together, we're strong. And when we stand together, anything is possible, comrades. Yes. Yes. 
My name's Greg Hatfield and I'm a socialist. I grew up in Barnsley in mining town as a contemporary of Billy Casper. I played on the same football field as Billy Casper and Brian Glover. I saw Paul Foote above the Devonshire Arms at the age of 14, I was, not he was, in 1970. And that's when I became a socialist. Because my grandfather died down the pits of Barnsley, not as a miner, as a rescuer. He went down and rescued a team in 1936, came back up with them, and went back down again and got blown up. My mother was six years old. My, my uncle was 10 days old. She was still in hospital. Warncliffe Woodmore. I was at Warncliffe Woodmore Memorial when the BBC, I think it was Sky, was filming me. And a Labour MP said they've shipped in Hadfield to launch Barnsley Momentum because they haven't got any supporters in Barnsley. I tell you what, they've got supporters in Barnsley. We've got supporters in Barnsley. It's not the Red Wall. It's a socialist city and a socialist town. And there's nobody more respected in that town than Ken Loach. <laughs> and if people say to me, as someone who's been thrice suspended, not for anti-Semitism, no, no, well, they said that, but for being a socialist, and then auto-excluded, not for being anti-Semite or socialist, no, no, I was auto-excluded, i.e. expelled, silly phrase, on the same day as Ken on the 13th, for organising this event, for being on the same stage as these socialists, for being in the same room as you guys and girls, right? Well, I don't care. There you go, yeah? <laughs> I am gobsmacked, I am emotional about the fact that someone like Ken, not because he's a great film maker or whatever, you're not? Because we, we have great... <laughs> not because of that. Who told me? We have, we have great human beings in the party, great socialists. We've got Ken, we've got Chris, we've got Paddy, we've got Jack in the socialist movement. And we're not welcome. So we have to do something else. We have to build a movement. There are countless, uncounted, countless people who are being hung out to dry, going through mental health and all sorts of shit and John MacDonald doesn't apologise to them. We want truth and re reconciliation. We want truth, yeah. but we want truth first. Yeah. And we want support. Yeah. And if they can't be bothered to support, then we don't want to be part of them because we can build our own movement, and we've shown it. I'm 65, but I sat next to Loki, who's younger, <laughs> last night, and he will take it on. Yeah. It's not down to me, Graham, Jackie, um, Ken, Chris, sorry, Chris, Paddy. It's not down to us, right? It's down to the next generation. But for goodness sake, let's just keep doing it. We've got urgently to find some answers. I said at a meeting yesterday, quoting a great Marxist, Gramsci, that the old world is dying, the new world is struggling to be born. And we have to find some answers to the really difficult problems that we have now that so much of the party has been closed down to the left. And I think the only way we can at least begin to fight back is not to follow the old trusted and failed methods of keeping your head down. We have to say what we believe in. We have to speak truth to power. And we have to organise. It won't be easy, comrades, but some of the testimony tonight I think is an inspiration to us as we try and build a better world. Thank you. It is a critical moment because we have four to 500,000 people who were touched by Jeremy Corbyn despite mistakes he made, Chris. And we can't let the moment pass because those who are in the Labour Party and who say it is viable it, it's possible to reclaim it, have to tell us what that path is. Yes. Because we know the rules are being bent and no one in the mainstream media will hold them to account. We know the more they, they want us to, to demonstrate and cause a fuss, because it demonstrates to the, to the right wing and the establishment that Starmer will kick us out. He wants to kick us out. 
He wants a small party. Mm. It's Mandelson gave the game away. You know, they want a small party where they speak directly to the media. media. So, and, and get donations from big business. So in a way, we, we endorse their project by the louder we complain and the more fuss we make. But we do have those hundreds of thousands of people who are still there. They won't be there for long. They will evaporate as time passes, month after month. More will turn away, more will get alienated, more, more will turn their backs on, on, on politics. But there are great campaigns, Black Lives Matter that you referred to, the anti uh, the, the protection of climate change, the defense of the NHS, Com campaign after campaign after campaign. Brilliant people, as we know. We are hugely strong if we can get that movement together now, but it's urgent. Now we are many. We've got to seize this moment. We really have to seize this moment. Anyway, thanks a lot, and see you soon. <laughs> What is clear is the path ahead of us is open, but we don't know which way to go. There is one way to go, and that is through solidarity. And that is what we must remember. Thank you, comrades, and solidarity. <laughs>